great chapter. A lot of great stuff in there. It starts off with hanging millstones around people's necks and throwing them into the sea if they hurt one of the little ones. We could definitely preach a message on that one. Uh, the end of the chapter is talking about end times events. One of my favorite things to study and to talk about, but we're not talking about that. When you might look at that text, when you hear the title of the message and say, where is he going with this? But actually, the title of my message originally was going to be, The Tithe is the Lord's. That's something the preachers don't typically want to preach about, <laughs> unless you're Benny Hinn. I just watched a clip of Benny Hinn uh, convincing everybody that if they gave $1,000 of a seed offering, I think is what they call it, to his ministry, then he promised their healing. And so, uh, you know, uh, man, I watched that documentary. It made me so mad, so mad. I agree with one of the guys on that video. They, they said, I hope there's a special place in hell for guys that would use their position in ministry like that to use all these people that are pushing their people, their, their crippled family on wheelchairs and, and, and don't, giving all the money that they have to get there so that Benny Hinn can pretend to wave some kind of, you know, magical power over them or something. It makes me so mad. I watched that and just got uh, got furious. But that has nothing to do with the message tonight, uh, this afternoon. The message is about the tithe, but it's going to take me a little while to get there. Uh, you'll probably be able to figure it out pretty soon, though. Uh, the title of the message is The 10% Rule. The 10% Rule. Now, I was just talking uh, to Brother Austin about starting up running. He said he's going to start again. I'm going to start again. I got my eyes set on next November. I want to be able to do that 100 miler. And uh, so I got to start training, but I've been so long without running now, and I got knee problem, and I got uh, something. I mean, you know, maybe it's old age or something, but I got all these, these issues. And so to get from here to there, there is a general rule that they teach you uh, in physical training of any sort, really. That's the 10% rule. And the 10% rule is. You should never increase what you're going to do uh, by more than 10% or you might hurt yourself. You ever heard of that? It's called the 10% rule. Same would be, at least for beginners, you know, there comes a time whenever these, these rules don't necessarily match up. So uh, same would be for working out, lifting weights. Like you want to increase your reps. You want to increase how much weight you're lifting. But this rule of thumb is 10%. I don't know where they get the 10%, but they say if you stay within the 10%, you know, then you will... Uh, uh, be able to, you know, reach your goals without hurting yourself. That's what they call the 10% rule in running, uh, strength training, what have you. But then if you look that up, there's also a 10% rule when it comes to money management. Again, this would be for beginners, somebody that's, you know, very wealthy or something like that. This might not apply to them. But they say if you were to put 10% of your money from every paycheck aside, you would have, you'd be set for your retirement whenever you reach that, uh, that age. And so the g rule of thumb that some will say is always save 10%. Save 10%. I don't do that, but I'm just saying <laughs> it's, it's, if you're into uh, money management and all that, Dave Ramsey or whatever, that's what they're going to say. It's a 10% rule. All right. Then there's also a 10% rule in biology. Anybody know this one? Homeschool kids, anybody? 10% rule when it comes to biology. Who thinks they know? I just learned this the other day, okay? This shows me, uh, shows you how much I know. But So here's the rule in biology, in the ecosystem, when uh, the amount of energy that comes from the sun, right, and then a plant receives that energy, uh, there's only, there's like 90% loss of energy when it goes from one, I can't think of the name right now, I can't remember, but when it goes from one phase to the other, okay? So you got from the sun to the grass, and then from the grass to whatever eats that grass, and then to whatever eats that thing that ate that grass, and each time it's only passing on about 10% of the energy that was used. I just thought that was interesting. I'm studying all these things and, and all these 10%, right? It's just a, it's not always 100, you know, it's not, you're not always going to be at 10%, but it's a rule of thumb, right, that you can pretty much expect 10% to be a good, a good number. <clears throat> I even noticed this. I was like, I, I, I wonder, okay, I'm just, I'm not saying this is always going to be accurate, but I just wonder, okay, how many likes would you have to get on social media before you get a share? And so I look it up, and I kid you not, the uh, first thing that I showed was some, uh, saw on Facebook was some advertisement for uh, some kind of uh, series that's coming on, like TV or something like that, and I just, out of curiosity, I looked down, 
and we're talking about likes in the thousands or whatever, and forever, how many likes there were, let's say there was like 100,000 likes or something like that, there was exactly 10% shares. And, uh, and I thought, well, that's interesting. I looked down some of my uh, posts, you know, YouTube videos and stuff like that that I've made, and that's a pretty good rule of thumb. Not always exact, exactly that way, but that's a pretty good, good rule of thumb. Well, in the Bible, I noticed this, other, this principle to be the case. Look again at Luke 17. I already read this, but look at verse 11 there. It came to pass as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee, and he entered into the certain village. There met him ten men who were lepers, which stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go, show yourselves unto the priests. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. And Jesus said unto him, where, uh, were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? They were not found that returned to give glory to God, save this stranger. And so you look at that story, and you might not think, read a whole lot into it, uh, but one of the things that's always stuck in my mind, I've used this a whole bunch of times when trying to explain the gospel to somebody or, or the fact that not everybody who, who gets saved is necessarily going to give their life and give all their you know, talent and abilities and resources to the Lord. I've used this principle. Now, all ten were healed. Jesus didn't say, well, only one of them came to thank me, so I'm going to take away all the other healing. And that physical healing was just a, a sign, a picture, if you will, of, of spiritual healing in Christ, right? He saves, he saves somebody. And I think that's a pretty good principle. Like uh, you can expect if 10 people get saved, you know, maybe only one of them is actually going to get totally on board and, uh, and, uh, and be, a, be a disciple. And so I, I thought about this, and we've used this before when talking about what kind of statistics you can uh, figure when you're out knocking doors. I'm not going to say, again, that this is accurate all the time, but this is what I've told people, and I think it kind of follows this 10% rule, and that's this. If you knock on 10 doors, you know, some days you're going to get more and some days you're going to get less, but you knock on 10 doors, you'll probably get the opportunity to present the gospel to one person very clearly, right? Sometimes maybe you'll get halfway through, they're not interested, or sometimes, you know, uh, they'll shut the door uh, in your face or whatever. But maybe after you knock about 10 doors, you'll get to present the gospel clearly to at least one person. And that's a pretty good rule of, of thumb. Now, how about, how about this, though? If you get to present a, a clear gospel plan to 10 people, maybe one of those will actually receive the, receive the Lord and receive salvation. So uh, I don't know if that is completely accurate, but that's something that you could kind of say as an estimate. I think that would be pretty, pretty clear, which would mean then you'd have to knock on 100 doors statistically to see somebody get saved, if that's true. And obviously, like I said, sometimes it's going to be a lot more than that, but maybe something that you could see. This is not something set in stone. You understand what I'm saying? It's a general principle. Just like I don't have to follow a 10% rule when I'm training on my mileage, but I could say, well, here's a pretty good rule of thumb. You know, if I'm, if, if, if I'm managing my finances and I say, I really want to save money, you know, it could be 10%, could be 15%, could be 9%, 8%. It's a rule of thumb, but 10% is pretty, pretty much in the ballpark. I, I see that all throughout uh, uh, Scripture and all in our everyday life. Pretty good principle. And, uh, and certainly, if you got 10 people saved, 10 people, uh, uh, you know, or 10 people that actually get saved, yeah, only one of them will probably get in church and get on board and get busy. That's just a, a general principle, you know. Now, there's other ways to attract people in or whatever, but you understand what I'm saying. So there's this rule with, uh, throughout the Bible that I think is pretty interesting. Uh, here's a thought. Look at Daniel chapter 7. Brother uh, Nick, a while back, uh, presented this to me, just asked me what I thought about this. And I had never noticed this before. And I'm not trying to teach some kind of strange doctrine here. I'm just, uh, uh, it's just an interesting observation that Brother Nick had. But Daniel chapter 7, look at verse 9. Now, 
<clears throat> you can line this up with Revelation and probably it'll answer a little clearly what's going on here. It says, I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. Amazing how all the pictures in the Bible where somebody saw a vision of the Lord are so accurately the same. You know, different people, they're not sharing the same vision. They're having separate visions, but these wheels and the fire and the flame. Anyway, that's another study for another day. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. And look at this. Thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were opened. Again, there's a scene that you can look in Revelation and see where they're standing before God. And, and uh, Brother Nick was saying, isn't that interesting? There's 10% of the 10,000s uh, times 10,000s, right? You got 10% that are standing there serving the Lord. And, and, uh, and, and there's a, there seems to be a, a distinction between the two. Now, I think if you look at Revelation, you can see those are probably angels, all right? But what I told Brother Nick was like, you know, that would be interesting, especially if I was a Calvinist, <laughs> which I'm not, because the Bible says that uh, the tithe belongs to the Lord. And wouldn't it be interesting to find out that 10% of people, you know, get saved. 10% of those who are saved, you know, are special servants that God, God gives. Not saying that. Don't read into that. Make some kind of weird doctrine out of it. But I'm just saying, isn't that interesting how these numbers of tens uh, come up in the Bible? And, uh, and so let me give you this thought here. And you know that I'm working my way over to the tithing. So we'll talk about that in a minute. But how about this principle, a principle of the Sabbaths? Okay, now I know that's not 10, that's 7, okay? So that'd be like more like 14% rule, I think. And so uh, here's the, the idea of Sabbaths. And we're not going to go through there. You understand all throughout the Old Testament, many of these Sabbath days were administered. And that was this, uh, every seventh day is the day of rest. Okay, so you work, Sunday would be the first day of the week, and you work every day, and on the seventh day, you would have a day of rest. You know, that's one-seventh of, of your time that you're given to the Lord. And it would be a little closer to 10 if you think about it this way, though. Most of that, or a big portion of that time, we're sleeping every day, right? Even on Sunday, even on, even on Saturdays or whatever. And so, uh, and so some of those days are sleeping. Plus this, how many of us actually work six days a week, 12-hour shifts every day, like, like was custom, you know, uh, work day for, uh, for Jews back then? And so that's getting a little bit closer to the 10th, but you understand a principle. Let's leave the 10% alone. Let's not get too hung up on that or the 7%, uh, 14% or whatever. Uh, let's just say this. There's this principle that says this. God gave you 24 hours a day. He gave you seven days a week. And he said, I'll tell you what, give me one. Now, this is an Old Testament, okay? I understand that. He said, give me one of those days. Uh, there was a, also a Sabbath where on the seventh day, I mean, on the seventh year, servants were set free. And then there was a Sabbath of the land every seven years. On the seventh year, the land had to rest. All right. It's a good principle. Now, look, even if you say, well, I don't know why God had him do that. That's weird. I mean, you know, this, why, why did he have these weird laws? You know, why, did he, why, couldn't, why couldn't you uh, uh, mix certain seeds in the ground? Why couldn't you mix fabrics that you wear? Everybody wants to go to the Old Testament and, and try to point out what they think are weird laws. But uh, so much of the Bible, uh, even the Old Testament laws, just made a lot of sense if you think about it. And so, you know, there was something in our history uh, called the Dust Bowl. You guys heard, heard that story? And, and what happens is they work that land until that land couldn't be worked anymore, and they never gave it any rest. And so what happened is all of a sudden crops weren't producing anymore. I'm not saying that was a judgment of God or punishment because they weren't honoring the Sabbaths of the Old Testament, but what I'm saying is that was a general rule that was a good rule that if people would have followed, probably things would have worked out a lot better, right? <clears throat> and so even today, farmers will tell you that you should do that. Okay, now of course we understand this, that we are not under certain laws. Let's just go ahead and look at them. Romans 14. Romans 14. Just in case somebody wonders, like, well, should we be honoring the Sabbath? Romans chapter 14. Uh, 
And look at verse 5. One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord, and, that he, and he that regardeth not the day to the Lord, he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, uh, for he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not to the Lord, he eateth not. Giveth and giveth God thanks. You understand this principle that we're not supposed to go around saying, you know, hey, you have to honor this day above all these other days. You have to, you know, uh, you have to celebrate this feast day. You have to celebrate. No, actually, the Bible's pretty clear that we don't have to follow any of those rules anymore. Now, when it comes to the Sabbath, the Bible makes it clear that the Lord fulfilled that Sabbath, okay? He's fulfilled our rest. He fulfilled a picture that was set in the Old Testament. We're not under those laws. The Bible makes this clear, but it's a good principle. If I go work my body for seven days and I don't give it any rest, it's probably going to get sick and break down. And you know, So really, it's even good for me that I would give my body a day off. Isn't that pretty much a, a common sense? And so that would be the same. Uh, all these principles are great. You don't have to follow them. They're not, you don't have to be legalistic about it. Okay, but they're good principles. <clears throat> now, we do understand that the Bible says uh, that the, they, we have examples of the meeting on the first day of the week, which would be the Lord's Day. They even call it the Lord's Day, and we understand that as Sunday, which is why we historically started meeting on Sundays, and we still meet every Sunday. That doesn't make it a Sabbath day, but it's, yeah, hey, it's a pretty good principle. One day out of the week, as a bare minimum, to give to the Lord, right? I've tried to explain that to people. They act like, oh, man, that's my day. Like, I work so hard, I don't have any days off. You know, and I'm like, well, you don't have one day that you could give the Lord that gave you all those days and blessed you with the job and blessed you with all those kinds of things? You don't have one day that you can give them? You know, the truth of the matter is we, can give them a whole, we could give them a whole lot more than that. But he just asked, uh, he asked for one day. And so then, uh, uh, and then in Hebrews 10, 25, Bible says this so much the more, right? Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. But then it says, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So as Christians, doesn't it make sense that we would do more than just the bare minimum of, well, if I meet once a week, I'm giving God my part. That's pretty good, right? right. It would make sense that we would do it so much the more. <clears throat> so now let me consider this principle of the tithe. Principle of the tithe. You will find out there so many views. And I've listened to a lot of different preachers, lots of different views, talked to lots of individuals, different views about the tithe. Number one, they'll say the tithe isn't for us. You ever heard that one? The tithe was for the Jews. We're not Jews, and so the tithe's not for us. And so they'll say that, which doesn't really touch on the matter of whether or not we should give to the Lord. It just says the tithe's not for us. Number two, some people will say this. I literally read an article that said, a Christian article that said it is wrong to give the tithe. It's wrong to give the tithe. And I don't understand what they were saying about that. I mean, I read the article. I, I still don't understand <laughs> what they were saying. But they were just saying that, you know, oh, well, you're going to, you know, you're, you're basically what they think is like the Benny Hint. Like you're trying to convince the people, like, if you don't give the tithe, God's not going to bless you and all that kind of stuff. And they're holding him to that. Or, or you know, you can go back. Uh, I remember coming across these old records from Southern Baptist back in like the 40s and 50s, the Southern Baptist Church, and they had this tithe uh, envelope or something that, uh, you know, uh, no, I know what it was. It was a reminder. They would mail these reminders to people and say, you know, hey, we didn't get your tithe this week, you know, just as just a reminder, right? And so then they had another letter that was like the secondary, like, they still didn't send in their tithe, then they would send this, and it was like, hey, don't you love your church? What's going on? It's a little more aggressive, right? And then the last one is just like bashing them for not giving their tithe, you know, like, like well, how dare you? You know, you're so, you're so wicked not to give God. Don't you know the tithe is the Lord's and all this kind of stuff? And so there are some churches that have abused that, and they've made it sound like, you know, God's going to get you if you don't give the 10%. And uh, to this day, I mean, we have people that will write their 10%, man, to the penny, you know, and I don't care. I mean, that's good if that's between that's between you and the Lord. But uh, but some people would do that because they're they're super strict about keeping that, you know. And then you have other people that say, 
We should give way more than the tithe. What are you talking about? Don't you read uh, the early disciples, man? They sold their possessions and they gave all. We should really give like the New Testament. You know, I've heard him say this. The 10% was that was just a, for starters, right? Uh, but what we need to do is give way above and beyond that. and give, Everything is God's, right? <laughs> and so there are some people that will get radical about that. And then, like I said, there are those who will write it out to the, the penny, you know. I've heard people question, like, should you give off of your gross income or your net income? And there's a lot of questions. And some of these are honest questions, good questions. I don't mind answering them. Some of them are, uh, uh, they make a lot of sense. And you certainly want to be right before God in doing what you do. And so uh, these things are worth uh, talking about. Now, let's talk about the tithe. Is the tithe, was that just an Old Testament thing? Is it a New Testament thing? What are the specifics given to it? Well, uh, first of all, doesn't it make sense? Doesn't the 10% principle kind of make sense? If, if 10%, I mean, if we can give one day out of the week and we can give, you know, uh, uh, one year uh, out of every seven years for the land to rest, you know, if these are good principles that make sense, wouldn't it also make sense? Hey, we can give God, uh, certainly we can give him a tenth. I mean, we give the government that on our taxes, right? <laughs> and really, I think it would make sense if they would say, hey, we're just charging 10% for everybody. doesn't matter how much you make, how little you make, just 10% flat tax, whatever. In my opinion, that would be a good idea. That would, work. <laughs> that would make a lot better sense, right? Now, I actually got a comment on something uh, on social media where somebody said, I have no idea what this person was talking about, where, where they got this, but they were like, you guys are worshiping Caesar and charging taxes to all your church members. I'm like, first of all, I don't know what you're talking about worshiping Caesar. I certainly don't worship any, any leader. And I'm, I think he was referring to Trump, and I'm not even a Trump supporter. <laughs> right? And so I'm like, I don't even know what you're talking about. And I don't charge any taxes to anybody. So uh, I don't, that's, a, that's a, quite, a, quite a, an accusation to be made there. But I do believe that 10% makes some pretty good sense. And I could show you from the Bible. Uh, number one, let's look at Genesis 14. Genesis 14, you'll notice this is before the law. The law came about in Exodus, right, with Moses. God gave Moses the law. But in Exodus 14, we see the practice of, of tithing. Chapter 14, verse 18. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand, and he, hath give, and he gave him tithes of all. Now, it almost sounds like Melchizedek gave Abraham tithe, but I'll show you Hebrews chapter 7. Just to verify what's going on here, Hebrews chapter 7. Verse 1, for this... Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that king of Salem, which is king of peace. Now, I won't make a big uh, deal about it, but if Melchizedek isn't actually Jesus in this text, he's at the very least a picture of Jesus. There's no doubt about that by the titles that's used to him and, and uh, everything that's explained about him. But here you have this, this picture in the Old Testament reiterated, and it was that Abraham, and this is before the law, he gave to Melchizedek these tithes. Genesis chapter 28. Genesis chapter 28, again, before the law. This is just a principle. It's kind of like people were still, uh, there was still this general law before the, before the law of Moses where if somebody killed somebody, then their life should be taken for, you know, that was like corporal punishment for murder. You know, that was a law. They didn't need Moses to give the law for that. That's just something that they did. It just made sense. It was a rule. Uh, Genesis 28, 
20 through 22. Actually, the Sabbath day was kept before, uh, before that too, but anyway. Uh, 28, let me see, verse 20. And Jacob vowed a vow, saying, If God be, will be with me, and will keep me in this way that I go, and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on, so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God, and this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house, and all that thou uh, shalt give me, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. Now, I'm not saying anyone should make a vow to God or, or you, know, uh, you know, make some kind of a commitment like, God, I'll serve you if you allow me to have. Ex I've actually heard people say that. Lord, if God would just give me a million dollars, then I would, give, I would live off 10% and give, <laughs> you know, 90 to him or whatever. And guess what? God knows your heart, and you're probably never going to get that. <laughs> <laughs> but a lot of people think, like, oh, I'm just going to go on this. But I'm not saying to do that, but do you see this principle? He's saying, hey, if he would just, you know, prove to me, you know, and he, I will be his God, and I'll give him 10% of everything I had. It's just this kind of like, this is what you do. It's like a tax, but it's not a, it's not a tax. <laughs> it's just this principle of giving, right? And Jesus said, uh, uh, give unto Caesar that which is Caesar, and give unto God that which is God's, right? Yep. All right, so here's another thing. Uh, Jesus affirms in Matthew 23, people were practicing the tithe. And they were tithing strict, very strictly. These were the Pharisees, okay? They weren't even saved. <laughs> Maybe some of them got saved, but, uh, but the majority of these Pharisees were just uh, making up all these kind of crazy rules. But in Matthew 23, uh, 23, 23 it says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye pay tithe of mint and anise and cum cumin and have admitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. Now look, stop right there and someone's going to say, See, he's rebuking them for tithing and being so concerned and strict about following the law. But then he says this, These ought ye to have done and not to leave the other undone. I don't know which one was first, what he's talking about, but what he's, whichever one he's talking about, he's saying do one of those and don't leave the other one undone. That means do both of them, right? So he certainly wasn't saying that what they were doing was wrong by tithing the mint and the cumin and all that kind of stuff. Can you imagine if that's the way we gave tithes today, like go through the cupboards and, oh, it's time to do the tithes and get the cumin out. <laughs> cumin is my favorite spice, by the way. That's good stuff. All right. All right, here's another, uh, here's another principle of, uh, uh, just now again. So, so here's the funny thing. So, so here, we're in this series. It's, it's become an interesting series. I did not plan it this way, but it's become an interesting series because the idea was to go over some policies and some expectations for the local church. You know, just kind of looking off into the future, what kind of things could we expect to follow? Not necessarily that we have to have all these laws and creeds written down and everybody pledged to follow all the creeds, but just this is our expectations. Here's some policies that I have. And so we talked about the King James Bible, and I thought, yeah, I'm going to set forth this policy. And really, if you remember that message, it was pretty, like, you know, I was pretty soft. <laughs> just kind of like, you know, King James Bible, pure word of God. Don't you want pure words? Right. And that was pretty much the essence. And so uh, and then last week I was like, well, I'm going to talk about clothing. What are our expectations and our policies concerning clothing? You think, man, he's going to hammer it down. Tell them what regulations they have to learn. No, actually, what I said is over here is naked. Over here is clothed. Why would you want to walk as close to naked as you can? Wouldn't you just want to go clothed? Male, female, why would you, if you're a male, why would you want to walk closer to being a female, right? It's just some basic principles. I don't even have to go, well, the Bible says if you just cross this T and dot this I over here. No, really, there's some common sense principles that we should really just not even, just walk in the Spirit, right? You don't have to worry about all the laws because you're walking in the Spirit, you want to serve God. <coughs> Second Corinthians 9, 7 says this, Every man, according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give. Not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. You know, I would never want to make somebody give 10% every time they got a paycheck. If, if every time they did it, they're just like, don't you know what I could buy with this if I didn't have to give this? I don't even want that. And God doesn't want that. He loves a cheerful giver, right? Somebody who's like, I'm giving this because I want God to bless it. 
Yeah, I'm giving this because I want his work to, to forego. Somebody last uh, Thursday we talked about, somebody sent in a, a check just out of the blue. Never been to church here. He just said, you know what? Use this for soul winning. I noticed you guys doing a lot of soul winning, uh, and I like that. what's going on over there. Use this for soul winning. Well, you know what? The, <laughs> the Lord always blesses his work. People want to do his work, he's going to bless it. Amen. We've had people in our church who were, who were big givers. Made a lot of money, but you would never know it by the lifestyle that they lived, okay? And they gave to the church. And then later on in their life, they got sick. They got frail. They had to go to the nursing home. And so as a result, uh, this one particular man I'm thinking about, he was like real apologetic. You know, I'm sorry. I'm going to have to cut my giving in half. I really don't want to do that, but that's the only way. I'm like, brother... We don't need your money. <laughs> we love you, and we're glad that you're a giver, but God's going to take care of us. And guess what? That next week, somebody started tithing that has never tithed before. That next week, somebody else started coming to the church that was a tither. Uh, there was one person actually coming to the church now, but for months, they, were, they started sending their tithe to the church just because a friend of theirs went to the church and said how much they liked it. And so <laughs> I was like, well... You know, I'm not going to church, but I think I'll send my tithe to the church. And it was like, you know, God has always fulfilled where somebody else couldn't give. Amen. Right. So you say, well, that's not a very good message on tithing. You're supposed to be telling everybody you got to give the tithe. Right. It's the Lord's. <laughs> I'm not worried about what you give. Amen. Just like I'm not worried about what you wear or what you do at your own house. But here's the print. Here's the idea about it. Worship God first. Honor God first. And he's going to bless that. God loveth the cheerful giver, <clears throat> so don't give grudgingly. But I will say this, in my own personal life, maybe some weren't raised this way and they didn't uh, get to see some of this in action. In my personal life, uh, I was taught to prove God. You go to uh, 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 Malachi and it says, hey, prove me, prove me, try me. You know, see if I don't give more than you give. That's quite the paraphrase. <laughs> That's the Rocky version. But, uh, but what he's saying is, uh, he's saying, prove me, put me to the test. And so I was taught that. I grew up with faith promise giving. All right? well, I, don't, I don't do that in, at, at, as the pastor. I, I'm not a big fan of that, that uh, what do you call it, uh, philosophy, I guess. But the idea was this, like, they're just going to come up with this number by faith. Right? Again, I'm not recommending this. Come up with this number by faith, and then they'll say, I'm just going to give that to the Lord. And the idea was like every year you would just give a greater number, and it would be something that you could, you didn't even think that you could live off your paycheck without that money, but you would just give it by faith. And then at the end of the year, you'd be like, wow, God blessed above and beyond. And, gave, and I know a lot of people that said they put God to the test, they proved him, and he did that. And so, you know, for me, it was always a challenge just to make sure I got my tithe in. But I was like, okay, I'm going to just put God to the test. I'm going to obey. I'm going to give my tithe, right, because that's the way I treated it in my head, that 10% as a bare minimum, I'm going to give my 10%. And I kid you not, I probably shared this before because it's, it's, it's still to this day. I mean, I pay my, I give my tithe. You say, well, you're the pastor. Why are you doing tithing? I mean, that's some, you know, the church is paying you money. Yeah, but I want to set an example, okay? And so I give my tithe. In fact, I'll just tell you because I'm not trying to get any special blessings. I don't care if I lose this reward, okay? <laughs> I, I try to shoot for giving 20%. I want to give my tithes and offerings. And so I'm like, I'm going to shoot somewhere between 15 and 20% of, of what I get. I try to give back, not counting uh, uh, other, other, other things that, that you might give. And so that's just my goal, all right? Don't always hit that because sometimes I'm bad at spending money and, and <laughs> oops, messed up. But here's what I found in my life. If there was something I intended to give and I didn't give it, Something would happen inevitably. I'm not saying this as a scare tactic, okay? I'm not trying to scare anybody. I'm just saying in my own life, something would happen. And, uh, and I kid you not, man, I'd get a speeding ticket, and the price of that ticket was exactly what I was supposed to give, right? <laughs> or, uh, or a flat tire or something. Something would happen in my life, and, uh, and, and I would see that. I call it the, the Haggai principle. Look at Haggai chapter 1. Might take you a minute to find Haggai. <clears throat> Haggai chapter 1. Yeah, I'm going back to that Old Testament. Is that okay? Haggai chapter 1, look at verse 3. 
Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses, and this house lie waste? Now, therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. Ye have sown much, and bring in little. Ye eat, but ye have not enough. Ye drink, but ye are not filled with drink. Ye clothe you, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it into bags with holes. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You get the picture here? He's saying that this guy is like, well, you know what? I got to take care of mine first. And then later I'll give, you know, give to the Lord's work. And so what he does in his own, in his own uh, house, he's like, I got to seal this and all that. I got to make money for myself. And he says, yeah, well, here's what you're doing. You're putting money in bags and God's poking holes in your bags. And as you're walking down, the, the money's just falling out. And you think that you're building up your own wealth. But because you're being stingy to God, he's not going to allow the blessings uh, to come upon you. Again, it's not a scare tactic. I'm just telling you in my own personal life, this is the relationship that I've had when it comes to trying to give to the Lord's work. He's kind of showed that, look, if you just give, you just take care of, of, of the work I've called you to do. Don't stress out about, is there enough money for this? Is there enough money here? You just do what I called you to do. And, uh, and guess what? I'm going to make it last. You think about the children of Israel. One of the great miracles that is kind of often overlooked is that the children wandering through the wilderness, the Bible says that their clothes didn't even wear out. <laughs> right? And now that's an amazing thing. And clothes were expensive and hard to make back then. <laughs> but uh, what God's saying is, look, I'm going to take care of you. And, and, and the opposite is true, too. If you're so worried about yourself and pride and I'm going to take care of mine, I don't have time for God, I can't go to church, I can't give, I can't be involved in this ministry, I can't go soul winning because i got too much going on in my life, well, guess what? You're probably never going to get ahead, right? You're probably never going to have the resources that you, and the comforts that you're looking for because you can't get that by your own works. Not if you're a child of God. I think someone that's lost, probably a reprobate, they could probably go off and be like, oh, look what I've done. I'll build barns. I tear down my barns and build bigger barns, <laughs> right? And Jesus said, yeah, well, today, you know, your life's going to be ended. That's going to be uh, all come to naught. So let me give you, my, give you my expectations, if you will. Not that these are important, but I'm just telling you as a basic principle, these are what I would suspect everybody uh, to do. Number one, I don't enforce, okay? Uh, I don't enforce, hey, if someone's not paying their tithe, you know, they don't get to be members. <laughs> if somebody's not given enough money, you know, I, I would never do that. So we're not enforcing anything like that. Uh, I do believe that uh, that we each should be involved in supporting the work of the ministry for if it's going to be our church, and that we should give. I think the best principle would be ten percent. All right. Now, if someone can give more than that, give more than that. And if something happens and you're not able to give that, nobody's going to look and say, well. Shame on you, you didn't give your part, okay? But my, uh, my policy is not to ever enforce. It's a gift. It's not a, it's not a tax or something like that. <clears throat> and usually what happens in a church is there's always, you know, there used to be this what was called 20-80 uh, principle where 80% of the people will carry the work, you know, and the 20% or other way around. 20% will carry the work and the 80%. After this message, maybe it's 10, 10, 90, <laughs> okay, 10% principle, but anyway, uh, and so I think that's true. A lot of times there's a smaller amount of people in the church that are giving above and beyond, you know, I couldn't even uh, sh uh, share with you. They wouldn't want me to, and I wouldn't want to embarrass anybody, but uh, share with you uh, what some have done, and I think of some of our older people, 70s, 80s uh, in, in Iola, uh, there's an 80-year-old still working like crazy, uh, working herself to death, I couldn't keep up with her, and just gives and gives and gives and gives, and I'm almost, I almost want to be like, can you stop giving, man? I, you need this. You need to start laying up money, man. You might be, but the Lord just takes, takes care of her and blesses her, and she just has that, that heart to give, and so this kind of giving that some people do, it carries the weight of those people that don't give, and, and I don't stress about the ones that don't give, right? So we got the man camp coming up. There's a charge for that, Right. But my policy is, hey, you guys pay your you guys pay your tithes and offerings. Right. 
I don't, we don't have to budget out and say, well, how much did you give? Did you give enough to be able to afford to go? When we go on these trips, we're just going to go. And if the money's not there, we just won't go or, or something or, or ask people to give a little bit more or something. But, uh, but typically, we haven't, I've, since I've been the pastor, I know it's only been a year and a half, but I've never had to worry about anything like that. When we want to go somewhere, let's just go. We need to buy a meal for somebody, just buy a meal. You know, and the Lord has just covered, and just people will just give whenever the Lord prompts them to give, and it's just a blessing. Okay, so I'm not going to enforce it on anybody. <laughs> I'll also say this, though, that I do think that a standard should be set by anybody who would be like in a staff position or have some kind of a ministry position. Uh, you know, I've been in a lot of churches where, uh, and I know probably I shouldn't know who's given what, but it's like there's a, um, uh, you know, someone's like the treasurer or whatever, and they're not given anything, you know. And so that would be, uh, I just think that wouldn't make very much sense. These guys are supposed to be setting an example, showing that they support the work and the, uh, and the ministry. And having a say about where things go, you know, that would, uh, it would, it would make sense then that they would want to support that ministry. <clears throat> All, uh, uh, now here's a, here's a good question. You know, if, and, if, and here's something too. If somebody has the mindset, like, I don't want anybody to know what I give, so it's all done secretly, I'm just, you know, I'm going to give cash so nobody knows who gave it, or I'm going to send something in, that's fine, man. I would never try to tell somebody to change that. Here's my personal opinion. Uh, almsgiving, when the Bible says not to, you know, let your left hand know what your right hand is doing or the other way around, uh, almsgiving is different than tithing, I believe. Okay, so here's the, here's the idea. If, if anybody gave 10%, if, if everybody in this room gave 10% and one person makes a whole lot more money than everybody else, and so they gave a whole lot more, but it was still 10%, do you know they gave the exact amount as somebody who is the poorest person in the room who gave 10%? <laughs> There's really no difference. Right. And so anybody that would look and say, oh, did you see how much that person gave? Yeah, God doesn't see it that way. And so, uh, and so I would never see it that way. I mean, I, I would try, try not to. I guess anyone's human and could get like, uh, you know, uh, and that's another thing, by the way. Any preacher uh, that would ever, if you ever kept caught me doing something like this or thought that I uh, suspected me of doing something like this, man, you need to be in my face on this. But any preacher that would like change what they preach or their policies or something like that just to uh, appeal to somebody who is a big giver, uh, you know, that guy needs to go because the bigger the big givers that flash money in front of the preacher's face, that's wicked. And the Bible says not to receive a gift, okay, and, and, and for that kind of a con, uh, context. And, uh, and you know what? Uh, there's been people that gave in the church who I knew believed something different than I did, and I didn't hesitate for one minute to change what I believed so that they would keep on, uh, keep on giving or something like that because that's not God, God's always uh, takes care of those kind of situations. <clears throat> All right, but I got off off track here. But uh, so here's the thing, though. Uh, but there are a lot of times people don't want to. Now, recently, and somebody asked me about this, so maybe I'll just address. If uh, the end of the end of the year reports, contribution reports, what I do for that is I take uh, uh, those envelopes that we have. Anyone that does the tithing and offerings or whatever, I total all that up at the end of the year. Some people record that on their taxes and it's all tax deductible or whatever. But I think you gotta like itemize like $12,000 or something like that. I don't know what it is uh, before that'll do you any good. That You'd have to be given quite a bit uh, for that to do you any good. Uh, but anyway, so some people keep track of all that and they write all that down. Other people are like, no, I don't want any, any track of that. Well, that's fine, but there's also this tendency sometimes to be like, you know, I don't want anybody to know what I give. And really what they're trying to hide is how little they actually give. <laughs> right? so, so what you see is like, the, uh, this is what I noticed when I was a kid. They'd pass the offering plate, and people would have these one. If you ever count money at the end of the service, you'll see a bunch of ones that are always like folded in thirds. So it's a little bitty. Why? Because people don't know if you're giving a 5 or a 10 or a 20 or what. It's actually a $1 bill, but they fold it up. I don't want anyone to see what I'm giving, right? <laughs> really, they're just giving a one. So, you know, and it's just going to be your heart. Between your heart, 
uh, in what you're doing for God. Don't try to like just try to pull the wool over anyone's eyes or something like that. That's silly. But uh, but I, I personally don't have any problem with somebody keeping records of that. You know, uh, I saw something on Facebook. Somebody asked a question. What about it? Is it wrong for me to how they say that? Is it wrong for me to claim that on my taxes? I think maybe it was what they're asking. I say absolutely not. Right. Uh, you, that's what that's just between the government and, you You know, whatever their policies are. Who cares? Uh, that doesn't have to do with the church so much. Uh, but, you know, I'll just tell you what I do. Any money I get back, you know, from the government for like, you know, those of us that have kids, you know, that a lot of times that's a huge tax deduction. I tithe on that. <laughs> Nothing says I got to do that. But why not? Why wouldn't you just want to give give to the Lord? OK, so. Nothing wrong with having records. There's nothing wrong. Here's the bottom line. We need to just do as we, how did it say? As he purposeth in his heart, so let him give. What we can do, what we're willing to do, what we want to do for the Lord, just do it. And trust him to take care of it. That doesn't mean we got to go around judging people. That doesn't mean we have to like uh, uh, become like legalistic about it, you know, and say, well, everybody's got to just follow the law to a T and all that. No, I really have this feeling that if you just love the Lord and want to serve Him and want to give to His work, He's going to bless you. You're going to keep giving. The ones that don't want to give are not going to give. Don't worry about it, okay? But, uh, but anyway, the, uh, uh, that's, that's just a general uh, principle, I think, that we should follow. 10% good r- rule of thumb, you know? Give one day off, good rule of thumb. If you can give more... Give more. Thank the Lord we got guys that give a whole lot more than that. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Thank you, Lord, for your Bible that you gave us. Thank you for these principles. Certainly a lot of strict laws in the Old Testament that nobody was ever able to follow properly and uh, just became a huge burden uh, to people. But we know the law was perfect. You know, one day, Lord, you'll, we'll, uh, those laws will be enforced and everybody will have to keep them perfectly. But, uh, but, Lord, as we live uh, today in this, trying to walk in the Spirit and trying to serve you, I pray, Lord, that you just help us to do it cheerfully and not grudgingly. And everything that we give, every standard that we have, everything we do for you or we give up for you or whatever, Lord, just would you please bless it uh, for your honor and glory and so that we would be able to accomplish more for you. And we ask that you do that in Jesus' name. Amen.